chapter 4 and let's talk about God's mission for a few minutes this morning. Luke chapter 4 beginning in verse 14. It says Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up on, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. We're going to pray in just one moment and as we pray I want to ask you if you would join me and pray for a very special friend of mine in Myanmar. This is Pastor Singpu and his wife Kim and their little son Evan. Pastor Singpu is the pastor of Myanmar Harvest Church in Yangon. I met him during my recent trip he attended the three-day pastor's seminar that we taught over there and we had some time to spend together and we've been corresponding ever since. Overnight Friday I received an email of distress just asking for our prayers. Churches in Myanmar are not allowed to uh, build church buildings. They're not allowed to own property in the name of a church. Uh, there are many churches that date back to the British colonial days and if a church property has belonged to a church for a hundred years or 150 years then they are permitted to continue operating there but they're not allowed to build any new churches. About 10 years ago Pastor Singpu and his congregation built a small building on a property that is a residential property and they've been worshiping there and uh, recently a neighbor has begun to antagonize them, uh, to persecute them, to bring charges in front of the government and uh, it's been escalating for the last few weeks and on Easter Sunday morning last week while the people were gathered for worship they got together a big mob and they began throwing rocks at the church. When Pastor Singpu came out to see what was happening with a couple of his leaders, they stoned them. They weren't uh, harmed seriously. They had some uh, minor wounds, superficial wounds. But he just sent an email asking if we would pray. And so I want to just pray for him. I told him that we would pray in all of our services and we would ask God to come and to bring a change in this situation. So as we pray this morning, would you stretch your hands forward towards the screen, towards the pa uh, photo of Pastor Singpu and let, let's just pray together. Let's agree in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for this morning and we thank you for the privilege, Lord, to gather in this comfortable, beautiful building, Lord, and to worship Jesus Christ in freedom, Lord. We thank you for the freedom to lift our voices. We thank you for the privilege of building a new building, Lord, so more people can come and join this song of worship to the Lamb, Lord. Father, we take these things for granted sometimes, but we thank you today, Lord, that we can do this. And Father, right now, in Jesus' name, we agree together on behalf of our friend, Pastor Singpu, Lord, his wife and his son, his leaders and his congregation. Father, we ask that you would come and be a shamar, be a hedge of thorns around them. Father, Father, I ask that you would protect them going in and coming out. Lord, I pray that you would just command angels, Lord, to go to that property, Lord, and to just set up around that perimeter. Lord, command your angels concerning to them so that no harm would come to them, Father. Lord, uh, I just pray that you would just uh, come and intervene in this situation, Lord. Father, we pray for this neighbor.
neighbor, Lord, who has become a persecutor of your church, Lord. We intercede for his salvation, Lord. We pray, Father, that he would have a Damascus Road encounter with the risen Christ, Lord. And that, Father, you would just uh, bring a radical change, Lord, to his heart and to this situation. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. You tear down the walls of hostility that separate people. And I pray, Jesus, that you would tear down, Lord, this wall of hostility. I pray that you'd just breathe your peace all over this church congregation, Lord, all over the church property, all over the neighborhood, Lord. And I pray, Father, what the enemy has meant for the destruction of your church, you would take and turn and use for your glory and for the salvation of many, Lord. We intercede, intercede for our friends on the other side of the world today. God, I pray that you'd do something extraordinary, Lord, that would bring Jesus more glory, Lord. And Father, as we just receive your word today, I pray that you'd breathe life among us by your Holy Spirit. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen, amen. and amen with me. Well, now that Easter has passed, we're going to turn our attention for the next couple of weeks to our building project. The weather is finally improving out there. Thank you, Jesus. And we're getting our ducks in a row to begin pouring concrete. One of the next big challenges that we have is we have to dig a very deep trench all the way across the parking lot where you're parked this morning so that we can run a drain pipe from the phase two foundation out to the wetlands that are all the way in the back of the property. We're also getting ready to cut through the basement wall in the lower level foyer where the two buildings are going to connect on the lower level. So what I'm trying to tell you is as messy as things are right now, it's about to get a little bit worse. It's about to get a little bit messier and we thank you for your prayers and we thank you for especially for your patience as we navigate around um, the next phase of work that we have to do. But I want to say as we look at that enormous crater outside that this whole thing is about so much more than a building. You know, I happen to like buildings, and our new building is going to be awesome, and I think it should be awesome to the glory of God, but I want to tell you that this whole thing is about so much more than a building. It's about God's mission on the earth. You know, the entire Bible is the story of God inviting one person after another to jump into his mission. God called an idol worshiper named Abram and invited him to jump into the mission. God spoke to Isaac during a famine and invited him to jump into the mission. He spoke to Jacob in a dream and invited him to jump into the mission. He spoke to Joseph through a series of dreams. God called to Moses from a burning bush and invited him to jump into the mission. He found Gideon hiding in a wine press. And he invited him to jump into the mission. He sent the prophet Samuel to Jesse's house. And he invited a shepherd boy named David to jump into the mission. Esther, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Nehemiah, Ezra. The list goes on and on. God sent the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary. And he invited her to jump into the mission. And God is still inviting people, one by one, to jump into his mission. And what is the mission? Jesus told us himself in Luke chapter 4. As I look at his words, I see a few things that I want to share with you this morning about God's mission. What is God's mission? First of all, I find that God's mission is to broadcast a message of good news that brings an instant reward. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' public ministry begins in the synagogue at his hometown of Nazareth. This was Jesus' home church, if you will. He grew up in the Saturday school there. He learned Hebrew and he learned Torah there. He was bar mitzvah there. Now Jesus was a full grown man and he came back from the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. 
In the liturgy of the synagogue, he was invited to read from the prophets and then share the sermon. Jesus chose to read from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news. You know that word for good news is the word euangelion. Euangelion is translated into English as the gospel. It's the same word that we get our English word to evangelize, euangelion. Originally, the euangelion was the reward money that was paid to a runner who brought good news to a king. If an army won a decisive battle on a far off field, the runner that arrived first with the good news of the victory would receive an euangelion. He would receive a handsome reward from the king. Over time that word came to be used for both the message and the reward. And you know, I like that. God's mission is to broadcast everywhere on earth a message of good news that has a handsome reward attached to it. Beloved, I want to tell you that the gospel is not just another religious teaching. The gospel is not just another philosophy for life. It's not just a set of lofty moral ideals. The gospel is a divine message that brings immediate life-changing rewards. The gospel radically changes the fortunes of those who receive it. The gospel enriches the lives of those who receive it. It brings great joy to the hearts of those who receive it. It brings peace of mind to those who receive it. And God's mission is to broadcast this message so that people everywhere can receive its wonderful rewards. What is God's mission? Another thing I find in the words of Jesus, God's mission is to relieve the poor. Jesus said his message was good news for the poor. Now that certainly might include people who are in financial need, but Jesus has something more than earthly economics in mind. The poor are people who have fallen behind in the game of life. People who have been unlucky in love. People who are lonely. People who loved once and lost. The poor are people who have been unwanted and unwelcome by others. People who have suffered rejection. People who have been overlooked or undervalued. The poor are people who are plagued by deep-seated insecurities. People who dislike themselves. People who are driven by the need to be accepted. You know, Zacchaeus was such a man, though he was powerful and very wealthy, he was driven by the feeling within that he didn't measure up to other men. He was financially secure, but he was personally insecure. The poor are people who are spiritually bankrupt. Jesus talked to a group like this in the book of Revelation. He said, you think you are rich. You think you have need of nothing, but you don't realize that morally and spiritually you're bankrupt. I counsel you to buy from me the true riches of godly wisdom and righteousness and spiritual sight. The kind of poverty that Jesus is talking about is the kind that cuts across all economic strata. It cuts across all social classes. It affects men and women alike, young and old alike, educated and illiterate alike, the prominent and peasants alike. The poor are down and outers and up and outers. And only the message of Jesus can bring relief to this kind of poverty. Only the message of Jesus can change the fortunes and enrich the lives of these kind of poor people. That is God's mission. What is God's mission? Another thing I find is that God's mission is to release the captives. The captivity that Jesus is talking about is the kind that imprisons people through invisible forces. 
Captives are people who are held in the grip of generational sins and sicknesses. Mental and emotional disorders that come down family lines. Physical diseases that come down family lines. Economic curses that come down family lines. Patterns of self-destructive behavior that come down family lines. Generational prejudice and hatred and anger, abuse, addictions. Captives are people who are held in the grip of sins that they open the door to themselves. Captives are people who long for a lasting change, but at best they journey through life trading one dependency for the next. This kind of captivity sentences men and women to an entire lifetime in prison, and then it ends with a death sentence. Only Jesus can set the captives free. Malcolm Muggeridge said, all other freedoms once won soon turn into new servitude. Christ is the only liberator whose liberation lasts forever. Jesus said it like this, whoever sins is a slave to sin, but whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That is God's mission. What is God's mission? Another thing I find in the words of Jesus. God's mission is to restore sight to the blind. The blindness that Jesus means is the kind that occurs with one's eyes wide open. Unlike physical blindness, the real tragedy of spiritual blindness is that the blind don't even know that they cannot see. Blindness is the ability to see everything except what is most important in life. Blindness is the ability to master every kind of academic discipline and yet be totally ignorant of eternal realities. Blindness is the inability to grasp spiritual truth. It's the inability to perceive the spiritual world. It's the inability to perceive the existence of God, the presence of God. It's to have no vision for the eternal life that follows this earthly life. Blindness is the ability to make the most amazing human achievements and yet be unable to solve the most basic perennial problems of mankind. Isn't it amazing to you for all of our technology, for all of our discoveries, for all that we can do, the most basic conflicts between people remain yet unresolved on the earth. Blindness is to stumble through life unable to find the path that leads to fulfillment and joy and health and peace and prosperity. Only Jesus can restore spiritual sight and wisdom to people who are plagued by this kind of blindness. Solomon said sinners grope around in deep darkness. They don't even know what makes them stumble. But the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn that keeps shining brighter and brighter and brighter until the full light of the noonday sun. Jesus said this, I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will never stumble about in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. That is God's mission. What's God's mission? Another thing I find is that God's mission is to rescue the bruised. Jesus said that he came to rescue the oppressed. The word there means bruised. People who have been dumped on by others. People who have been beaten up by life. The bruised are the abused. The bruised are the violated the victimized. The bruised are those who have been neglected and abandoned, betrayed. The bruised are those who have been cheated on, people who have suffered losses. Over the last few weeks, I don't know whether you've been tracking them, but there's been one heartbreaking story after the next about teens who have committed suicide after they were bullied at school and bullied online. You know, it's estimated that 5,000 teenagers will take their own lives this year in the United States of America as a result of bullying. It's one of the leading causes of death among teenagers. 
Parents, I need to tell you, you need to know what's going on, on online with your kids. You need to see everything. You need to see all their texts. You need to see all their emails. You need to see all their social media. When their sweet little heads are on their pillows at night, you sneak in their room and you go through their iPhone, their iPad, their iPod, I, I, I. Listen, it won't hurt them a bit. You do everything you need to do to protect your children. What would those grieving parents do differently now if they could turn back the hands of time a week or two or three? What would they do differently? Their kids were bruised and they didn't know what to do. If only they had known what Jesus can do. You see, that kind of bruising creates an oppressive condition in someone's spirit from which he or she must be released. And only Jesus can do that. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that bought our peace was laid on him on the cross. And by his stripes that bruising of our spirits is healed. That is God's mission. What's God's mission? Another thing I find in the words of Jesus. God's mission is to offer people grace without judgment. Just as important as the words that Jesus read from Isaiah are the words that Jesus omitted. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the bruised in spirit, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In the book of Isaiah, it goes on to say, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus left those words out. Why? Well, it's because Jesus came to offer people grace without judgment. He came to offer people the opportunity for divine amnesty. He came to offer people forgiveness with no consequence. The cancellation of their sin debts with no penalty. He came to offer people emancipation with no reprisals. Jesus came to usher in a season of grace with God's judgment suspended because of the cross so that people everywhere could hear God's offer of salvation and respond. Jesus said God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. So God sent his son to save the world. And everyone who believes in him is not condemned. That is God's mission. What is God's mission? One more thing I find in the words of Jesus. God's mission is to do everything that Jesus promised today. Jesus stopped reading with the words, the time of God's favor, the jubilee year, it is now. When he finished reading, Jesus sat down in the preaching chair. I think I need to get me a preaching chair. Especially by the time I get around to third service on Sunday morning. He sat down and he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You see, the Jewish people lived in the hope that Messiah would come and save them someday. But Jesus said, God sent me to save you today. Yes. Beloved, how many people muddle through life surviving on the hope that maybe someday things will get better. Someday my prince will come. Someday my ship will come in. Someday I'll get my lucky break. Mm, someday, child, things are going to get easier. Someday. 
But Jesus said, I'll relieve your poverty today. I'll release you from captivity today. I will restore your sight today. I will rescue you from a bruised spirit today. What is God's mission? It's to broadcast everywhere on earth this message of good news that has this reward attached to it. It's to relieve the poor. It's to release the captives. It's to restore sight to the blind. It's to rescue the bruised. It's to offer people grace without judgment. And it is to do it all today. And how does God accomplish this mission? Jesus showed us himself. First of all, God accomplishes his mission through the person of Jesus. Jesus is the one whom Isaiah foresaw. He is God's suffering servant. He is the unique son of God. He is the Jewish Messiah and the one and only savior of the world. Jesus is the one who relieves the poor. Jesus is the one who releases the captives. Jesus is the one who restores sight to the blind and who rescues the bruised. He does it through his substitutionary death on the cross. He does it through the cleansing power of his precious blood. He does it through the indescribable work of the Holy Spirit that comes through him. How does God accomplish his mission? Second, God accomplishes his mission through human messengers anointed to preach the gospel. Jesus said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Beloved, the time of salvation begins with the announcement of the good news. Preaching is what releases the now moment of salvation. Preaching in whatever form it might take. It might be preaching across a pulpit like this one or it might be just sharing the good news about Jesus across a kitchen table. It might be talking with your neighbor one-on-one -on -one while you're sitting in the car. Doesn't matter where, doesn't matter how, doesn't matter what style. What matters is that the message, the good news, releases the now moment of salvation in the hearts of people. God said in Isaiah, as the sky soars high above the earth, so the way I work surpasses the way that you work. Just as the rain and the snow descend from heaven and don't go back until they water the earth, so is my word out of my mouth. It will not come back to me empty-handed. It will do the work that I sent it to do. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the euangelion, the message with the reward, because it is the power of God to save everyone who believes. Paul said, faith comes by, and hearing comes by, and how shall they hear unless someone tells them? I want to tell you the truth. Every time we gather for worship, whether I'm preaching, whether Pastor Nick whether one of our pastors, whether one of our guests is preaching, every time we gather in here, I expect something to happen. I expect that now moment of salvation because the word is that powerful. How does God accomplish his mission? Finally, God accomplishes his mission through local communities of believers gathered in weekly worship services. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and help me as we close today. God accomplishes his mission through the local church. Beloved, I want you to listen to something today. You know, these words of Jesus, they're some of the best loved words of Jesus. They're some of the, the best known words of Jesus, but it's easy to overlook something in Luke 4. Luke says that Jesus was in the habit of worshiping in the synagogue every Sabbath day. To, to bring it home, we could put it this way. Jesus had a home church and he went to church every week. Jesus respected the practice 
of weekly corporate worship. He participated in weekly worship services. Jesus sang the hymns. He said the prayers. He read the scriptures. He followed the order of service. He submitted to the rules of the house. He respected the authority of the local community of faith and its leaders. Some believers have come to believe that belonging to a church isn't important. They don't see the value of participating in weekly worship gatherings. They don't want to submit to the authority of the local church led by deacons and elders. They're lone rangers. But you know, Jesus wasn't like that at all. Jesus valued weekly worship gatherings of local faith communities. It's true, Jesus had other vehicles for ministry. He had other venues for ministry. And we need those too. But it would be a huge mistake to overlook the fact that preaching and weekly worship services was an integral part of Jesus' ministry. And beloved, the weekly worship gatherings of God's people are still integral to the mission. Local churches are still integral to the mission. The weekly fellowship of believers is still integral to the mission. The weekly praises of God's people are still integral to the mission. The weekly ministry of the word is still integral to the mission. The weekly prayers of the saints are still integral to the mission. I like what Andy Stanley says. He says the local church is what God is doing in the world today. And that brings us back to that enormous crater outside. Have you noticed it's a rather large hole? <laughs> I have to tell you the truth. Some days when I walk past it, I get a little intimidated. I say, Lord Jesus, what have we done? What have we gotten ourselves into? It's too late to turn back now. <laughs> but I want to say that our new building is integral to the mission. It's integral to our mission as a congregation. It's integral to what God has called us to do here in Greenwich. You know, we have people who come from all over, but God promised us specifically a harvest in Greenwich, Connecticut, and there is a harvest yet coming from the residents of this town, and our new building is integral to that. Our new building is integral to what God wants to do through us in this whole region. It's integral to what God wants to do through us in his world. Helping pastors like Pastor Singpu. It's integral to what he wants to do through us in this last great season of harvest. And my prayer is today that you would simply believe that with me. My prayer is, is as things get messier around here, as we dig a giant trench across the parking lot and you have to navigate around it as we cut a hole in the basement wall that we're using for a classroom now because we have no space. My, my prayer is that as things get messier around here, you'll remember that it's all about the mission. My prayer is that you'll remember the mission as we ask you to give sacrificially again and again until phase two is finished and furnished and functioning. My prayer is that as we watch our new building take shape, that you'll always remember that it's not at all about a building, but it's all about God's mission in the world. Would you stand on your feet this morning? And would you give Jesus a great big praise for this good news that comes with such a great reward? Come on, let's just worship him. Let's just give him praise today.